What's going on guys, Awaco here. I'm in Lobosson, Switzerland, which is a remote town uh, near Saint-Croix, which is actually pretty close to the French border, am I correct? Yes, it's one of the most remote like regions of, of Switzerland, and therefore you know they make amazing watches, and I know for sure they do, because this is where Denis Flagiolet has his manufacturer for Debethune. I'm here with Pierre Jacques, the CEO of Debethune, the legend that is Denis Flagiolet, to talk about what makes Debethune so unique. Um, to me, it's one of the brands that expresses the most extraordinary technical value technical innovation and a completely unique and innovative design language that is all the work of this incredible guy. So let's go check that out. Pure Jack, how are you, brother? Not bad, I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you for uh, joining us here in Lobesson and visiting our workshop and factory. It's such a pleasure and I have to say with each passing year you get more handsome. I don't know how you do it. Yes, because uh, you know, I, his practice has continued to eat, to eat, to eat, to eat, to eat. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Fondue is very important as a part <laughs> of your regime, right? Very important. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about this. You know, like right now we're in uh, 2022, the watch industry is going crazy, right? As we can see, watches are more popular than ever. And in particular, independent watchmaking has exploded in popularity. I think a lot of that is because people have realized that independent watchmaking offers watches with a real singular vision, something really unique and created by real human beings that you can meet, like yourself and Denis Flau who we'll meet later. But it was really important to me to also identify those watchmakers that I think are most iconic. And to me, one of those watchmakers is definitely Denis Flagiolet, and I wanna to explain to you guys why. So, you know, one of the things that I love about Debethune is it's created such a singular language in terms of watchmaking. It's got an incredible combination of totally original aesthetics with the polished grade five titanium, with the flame bluing of the cases. But at the same time, it's got a technical language with like the triple parachute, with the three-dimensional movement face indicator with in-house balance wheels and I think they've got like nine balance wheels at this point have you yes. have nine balance wheels yes you don't it's think a, you're a bit of an overachiever you know uh, he's a nine that uh, I know uh, and of course you have just this extraordinary aesthetics as well and on this side you've got a tourbillon which is the lightest tourbillon cage in the world at 0.1.6 grams so we're going to discover all that stuff with the man who invented it the amazing Denis Flagiolet. Bonjour Denis comment ça va? Bonjour, ouais. Très, très grand plaisir d'être ici avec, euh, avec toi. Uh, so, guys, I'm going to have this part of the conversation in French. So, excuse me first, because my French is terrible. Uh, Denis, je dis, je vais faire ces conversations en français et je m'excuse parce que mon français, c'est affreux. Non, il est excellent, ton français. C'est très gentil. Je vais avoir ton anglais. Non, non, pas de tout. OK, nous sommes en train de discuter le langage technique de Devethu. Mm -hmm. Et moi, j ai, j ai, je suis très amoureuse avec quelques euh, innovations que vous avez créées. Le premier, je pense que c'est la phase de lune trois-dimensionnelle. Et ça, c'est ici dans mon montre, le DB28. Mais est-ce que vous pouvez décrire qu'est-ce que c'est l'inspiration pour ces complications Alors, l'inspiration, au départ, c'était euh, les premières phases de lune euh, qui ont existé. Euh, comme euh, c'était dans des énormes horloges, des horloges, des horloges de tour euh, ou des très grandes horloges, c'était facile pour euh, les hommes de représenter la lune en réel comme elle est en, vraiment en trois dimensions. C'est seulement bien après que l'on a aplati la lune pour qu'elle rentre euh, sous les cadrans. Et donc, l'inspiration, c'était quoi C'est de dire, mais non, pourquoi techniquement, on ne pourrait pas, euh, une fois, euh, refaire euh, une montre, enfin faire une montre avec cette lune euh, sphérique qui posait pas mal de problèmes techniques parce que évidemment ça doit passer sous la glace, ça doit passer avec les aiguilles, oui. mais c'était comme ça un, un challenge assez intéressant. Ok, excellent. I'm now going to uh, translate that with my limited capacity with French. But uh, the three-dimensional moon space indicator comes from tower clocks that were used back in the day, where the whole town would use this to tell what time it was, and they could also see what phase of the moon it was because when it was full moon, they would want to party really, really hard as you would want to back in the 16th century, correct? Um, and so the idea was, well, of course, three-dimensional moon uh, phases didn't exist in watches. At the time, uh, the moon was always represented by a two-dimensional indicator. But Denny was thinking, well, why not? Why couldn't you put a three-dimensional moon phase there? Of course, there's some huge technical challenges. It has to be able to pass underneath the sapphire. The hands might be in the way, possibly. But of course, with a, a genius like Denny Flagellet, anything is possible. So, uh, uh, Denis, the premier moment that there is a phase of the three dimensional, is the DB15, which is uh, uh, Quantum Perpetual. Oui. Voilà, c'est ça. Je l'ai. Ah, excellent. And guys, don't worry, uh, we're going to do some close-ups on this later as well, so you can see all the details of this watch, mm -hmm. but this is the piece. Et ça, c'est mon secret uh, 2004. Quatre. Oui. Voilà. So, uh, so it was invented in 2004, and I think it was the first perpetual calendar with the three-dimensional moon phase indicator. Dis-moi l'inspiration pour ce montre extraordinaire. 
Ben la, voilà, vraiment l'inspiration, c'était d'être dans une boîte de montres pour, pour notre époque quand même assez classique. Oui. Euh, c'était vraiment une, une transition de, de, de montrer en fait vers quoi l'horlogerie euh, pouvait aller ou oui. revenir, puisqu'elle revient vers, vers quelque chose en fait, euh, d'extrêmement classique, puisque là, en fait, on a des, on a des, des objets comme la lune euh, trois dimensions euh, du, du 15e, mais on a aussi euh, les cadrans argentés, euh, guillochés euh, de la fin du 18e, début du 19e. Euh, donc, c'était vraiment en fait, mettre euh, au poignet euh, un peu toute cette uh, grande histoire de l'horlogerie et cette grande culture de l'horlogerie. Amazing. And we're going to see more innovations behind this watch later, but what uh, Denny was saying is that he wanted to create a perpetual calendar that really paid tribute to the huge history of perpetual calendars and of classic watchmaking, but to insert this extraordinary three-dimensional moon face indicator into it as well. Now, the person I want to talk to about this watch is, in fact, Pierre Jacques, because back in 2004, he had the same job as me. He was a journalist, and he's actually the founder of GMT Magazine. So, Pierre Jacques, when you saw this watch, what did you think? Uh, what was that it was really something uh, first different in terms of aesthetic but also the, the fact that uh, bringing this uh, three uh, the moon face you know on a wristwatch was also a, uh, a performance and uh, so um, the first time I, I saw the uh, betting product you know even in uh, 2002 I, was, I felt directly uh, attract like a, like a magnet to the brand and uh, oh, we, we start to become a friend uh, at uh, the earliest stage of uh, the Bethune Amazing. with uh, Denis and David and uh, really the, the product from the beginning. We have their own DNA, uh, uh, a strong personality and uh, something that till today no one was able to uh, even uh, to try to make a fake copy. It's really it's a Debetune is yeah. a Debetune and you recognize any Debetune for, for far. Absolutely. And it was it at this time, the Pierre Jacques, that you decided uh, one day I'm going to be the CEO of Debetune? Yes, it, it, it was part of one of my dream and I was far to imagine that one day I will have the chance to, to join the team and, uh, and to, to be uh, where I am today. But because when, uh, of course, when uh, you publish uh, for the watch industry, You, you met many, many, you know, crazy guys, crazy company, nice company, and it's like a, a dream, but you know that it will not become true, but you know, this one became true. So ah, c'est cool. J'ai demandé à Pierre-Jacques parce que uh, 2004, nous sommes, le, il, so, il est journaliste aussi, mm -hmm. et il a disait que dans les premières fois qu'il a fait votre connaissance et vu les, les montres de d'Everything, il est tombé amoureuse et pensait rêver de peut-être un jour je pourrais être une partie de la société. So, mais, mais il pense que okay, c'est un rêve impossible, mais en fait, c'est possible. Et maintenant, nous sommes ensemble. Exact. Mais c'est possible et, et en fait, euh, c'est parce que euh, il avait, un, il avait ce rêve qui était un réel rêve, qui n'était pas un intérêt, qui était juste pour son plaisir en fait. Euh, et, et ça, quand, euh, quand euh, voilà, on a commencé à regarder ensemble comment on pouvait euh, travailler ensemble, ça se sent, tu vois, c'est oui. pas... Voilà, et donc, donc naturellement en fait, on a travaillé très rapidement, naturellement ensemble, de façon assez efficace. Et, et jamais Pierre euh, n'a cherché à... À, à modifier quoi que ce soit oui. par rapport à une, une vision de l'avenir de De Béthune. Euh, et justement, cette, cette recherche, cet ADN de départ, comme il parlait, en fait, il est vraiment là parce que, en fait, justement, le but, c'était vraiment ça. On met toute la culture horlogère au poignet et on essaye de le retranscrire dans notre monde actuel, dans notre monde moderne, oui. notre sensibilité euh, actuelle. Oh, yeah, that's really cool. So I was just saying it's, it's nice because uh, when Pierre Jacques saw the watch when he was a journalist, you know, obviously he was dreaming to be part of this, uh, this, this team or this family one day, but it became a, a, a reality. And, uh, and Denny was saying, yeah, but it was great because also Pierre has enormous respect for watchmaking culture. And uh, his part of this has always been to aid uh, in the creation and consolidation of one of the unique visions. Okay, guys, so what we're going to do now is walk over to this bench where the watchmaker is working on a three-dimensional moon phase indicator. And we're going to show you how it's actually made from two materials and one part of it is going to be flame blued. 
Guys, uh, right now we're with the, the watchmaker and he has a, um, a sphere that's made half of palladium and half of steel. And the blue part will react to heat and transform into this beautiful blue oxide color. Actually, you can see this on my case as well. Um, and that will give you the night part of the moon phase indicator. So, so Denny, uh, à ce moment-là, quand vous avez créé cette indication, est-ce que c'est l'idée de mettre, utiliser deux matériels, euh, une pièce de palladium, par exemple, et l'acier, et d'utiliser le traitement thermique pour changer la couleur de l'acier? Oui, alors traditionnellement, euh, les horlogers depuis la Renaissance ont bleui l'acier oui. euh, pour, euh, pour le protéger. Okay. Euh, et et c'est vrai que c'est quelque chose que les horlogers ont l'habitude de, de faire, on avait l'habitude de faire. Et donc, euh, quand il s'agissait de faire cette lune trois dimensions, euh, il existait déjà à plat ces, ces lunes bleuies euh, traditionnellement. Oui. Donc, euh, c'était assez évident pour moi de dire la, la face okay. noire, on va la faire, euh, on va la faire bleue. Cool. Euh, c'était la première partie en fait du travail sur le bleu euh, pour, euh, pour De Béthune. Ensuite de ça, quand j'ai travaillé sur les balanciers, euh, j'ai dû traiter les balanciers d'une certaine façon et euh, euh, je me suis retrouvé à faire du titane euh, bleu euh, pour un bon traitement des, des balanciers, pour euh, les stabiliser en fait. Et quand ils étaient bleus, j'ai fait exactement la même chose que les anciens avec l'acier bleu. Je ne me suis pas amusé à reblanchir parce oui. que c'était très beau. Autant oui. les laisser naturels comme ça. Ah, mais incroyable. Et c'est comme ça que j'ai commencé avec le titane bleu. Ah, avec oui. D'abord avec les balanciers. Incroyable. Puis petit à petit, nous avons fait des pièces bleues à l'intérieur du mouvement. Oui. Pour finir à la fin avec la DB28 kind of blue, oui. entièrement bleu. Incroyable. So guys, what's super interesting here is, is Denny was talking about uh, the tradition of, of flame bluing steel, right? Uh, this is used by traditional watchmakers because it actually uh, helps to the, the performance of the material, right? So you could do a thermal treatment to protect it. Uh, and this is also often done in hands, for example. Steel hands are blued and uh, it actually helps to create this oxide on top of it that protects the material. Uh, however, as he was then starting to work on his um, in-house balance wheels, uh, there was a part of it that was made in titanium. And he decided, okay, I want to use a heat treatment on this to you know, improve the performance. And it actually turned blue in the same way. But instead of removing this and just having the benefit of the heat treatment, he thought it was actually really beautiful. Why don't we just keep this? And this became part of his use of uh, thermal blued uh, titanium, which became a signature. And then this was extrapolated outwards later when he started to make um, grade five titanium high polished cases. He was thinking to himself, well, actually we could use the same thermal treatment to turn the cases blue. And the very first watch uh, that was made in series that had this treatment was actually this watch that's on my wrist here. So this is a kind of blue. So this is, came out slightly later, it's the tourbillon version, but this was the uh, very first watch where you had the entire uh, watch case, the mobile lugs, and actually the parts of the movement as well, and even the bridge of the tourbillon all uh, heat treated to become blue. C'est magnifique ça. Et c'est de créer cette esthétique très signature pour début d'une. Oui, et, na, et en fait, naturellement, je, sans, sans vouloir chercher à faire quelque chose absolument, c'est juste euh, un concours de différentes circonstances et qui ont amené le chemin de travail et de recherche à, euh, à, à, à faire... Euh, to 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 set a uh, identity de Bethune en fait. So extraordinaire. So what's really cool about it is uh Danny was saying actually uh, what resulted in something that was a signature aesthetic for De Bethune, this beautiful blue color was it actually happened really organically. It wasn't that he was searching for some sort of signature color. It wasn't he wasn't searching to create something that was distinct visually. It happened because of this evolution from performance into something that is visually stunning. And I think that that's that's what I love about De Bethune. Everything always has a meaning, right? So I have a watch here that's quite interesting because this is one of the earliest uh, watches that has uh, a lot of blue treatment on it. This is before the kind of blue. This is a DB28 that Denny had made for me, which I, I was very happy with. Uh, and then we started playing around with different parts of it to make it more and more blue. Uh, c'est une pièce unique qui, je pense que c'est créé avant de la de série de kind of blue. Oui. Et nous avons commencé de, de jouer un peu avec tous les, les, les bleus. Mm -hmm. Exact. It's cool. And as you guys can see here, what we did was we left the triple parachute uh, in polished titanium, which we thought was really cool. So, uh, Denny, one of the particularities of the watch is that it received a lot of shock. And you, you have a system called triple parachute for um, the shock. What is that? In fact, it's a parachute that permet euh, de pouvoir euh, empêcher, en cas de choc, 
euh, les pivots de l'axe de balancier de KC. Okay. Ça, c'est ce qu'il y a très souvent dans la plupart des montres, ce qu'on appelle un système anti-choc. Euh, euh, mais en plus de ça, en fait, euh, le pont euh, de, de, des montres de Béthune, euh, le coq, euh, lui, peut aussi se déplacer en cas de choc important. Oh, wow. il, est, il est monté sur des petites colonnes et en cas de vraiment gros choc, il peut se déplacer. Donc en fait, ce qui fait qu'on peut, on peut euh, en fait, supporter des chocs euh, beaucoup plus importants. La montre peut s'arrêter, éventuellement, si c'est un très gros choc, si ça laisse tomber des là, oui. il est possible qu'elle s'arrête, mais en fait, il n'y aura pas de casse à l'intérieur. Okay. Donc, ça sera beaucoup plus facile à remettre en état. Cool. So, guys, uh, what Danny is talking about is his invention called the triple parachute. So, I was mentioning, you know, a wristwatch receives so many micro shocks throughout the day, uh, but Danny was, you know, very concerned about this. So, he invented this system where, in addition to you having an anti-shock device on the axis of the balance wheel, on the bridge where the balance wheel is mounted, you have an anti-shock device on either side as well. And this allows the watch to be much more, or the balance wheel of the watch to be much more isolated from the shocks that it can receive. It can even, you know, sort of uh, overcome some fairly substantial shocks. Pierre Jacques. Yes. Can you think of a situation What? in which you would shock your watch very dramatically? I know you're a ski guy, you know. Uh, yes, uh, actually, uh, I, I love, uh, you know, uh, skiing, skiing uh, off, uh, off piste and, uh, you know, as I'm not a, I know, a huge expert, I, uh, I, I fold uh, couple of time uh, really hardly so no but uh, yes doing uh, you know many activity I, I like also you know to uh, to work not like Denis that level but I like to work uh, you know with my hand to make uh, you know maybe different work to work uh, uh, you know on uh, the mechanic part of my car you, you also you know um, uh, hit your, your watch a couple of time and uh, I can say, tell you that uh, uh, in uh, 11 years that I'm wearing actively the Betune, uh, I've seen no one has stopped on my wrist. That's incredible. 11 years where you've been wearing Debithune and none of them ever, ever, ever stopped. And much of that thanks to the triple parachute. So guys, what I want to talk about a little bit is this very famous watch called the DB15. Now that, as you may remember, is the perpetual calendar with the three-dimensional moon face, which was launched in 2004. But that watch was also super important because it was the very first watch that featured the triple parachute as well. So just here on this tray, we actually have a movement that does not have the triple parachute. And we'll do close-ups of this later for you as well. But what's really cool about this movement is it's previous to 2004. It's uh, an in-house movement. It features a, a three-arm uh, in-house balance wheel. And as you can see, the balance wheel is mounted on a bridge, which does not yet have the shock absorption system on either side of the bridge. So, Danny, quand est-ce que vous pensez qu'on est en train de créer ce mouvement? C'est, ah, ça peut être intéressant de mettre le parachute à deux, les deux côtés de le pont. Oui, en fait, euh, le, le, le fait euh, d'avoir fait, euh, fait ce pont euh, des deux côtés, c'est pour être extrêmement précis dans le positionnement du balancier. Oui. Donc il y a vraiment un avantage technique à tenir des deux côtés le pont, c'est très technique, euh, plutôt que de le faire euh, que d'un côté comme la plupart des montres. Oui. Seulement, ça rigidifie tout. Et, et, et comme ça rigidifiait, euh, j'ai fait des premiers essais au choc et je me suis dit, euh, alors il faudrait trouver une astuce pour assouplir. Oui. Et en fait, en, en, en cherchant comment assouplir, euh, j'ai fait glisser les colonnes de façon très mécanique avec des petits, des petits ressorts. Et, et en fait, euh, là, on arrive à quelque chose de, de, bien, de, de bien plus important et de bien mieux qu'un simple anti-choc. Euh, parce que justement, on a tout le pont qui peut, qui peut légèrement se déplacer en plus que l'anti-choc. Ah, et cool. donc, ça donne une bien meilleure souplesse euh, au mécanisme. Parce que c'est une des choses que j'aime love about David Thune. Quand vous voyez quelque chose sur votre wrist comme ça et vous regardez ce mécanisme et vous pensez, so cool looking, you have to understand that it always comes from something real, something truly horological. So it comes from this movement that uh, Denny was making with the bridge here, as you can see, and he was doing a full bridge for the movement. And he did this because he wanted the positioning of the balance wheel to be much more precise, where the balance wheel is engaging with the escapement and the gear train and so on, right? Because the more precise it is, the better the accuracy you have of your watch. But then it dawned on him because he was in the process of making this so rigid that he needed some opportunity for the balance wheel and the bridge to move slightly when it received a shock and that's when he started thinking maybe I'll put these shock absorbers with these tiny springs on either side of it. So the first watch 
that has this system is the DB15, as I mentioned, and that's on the back of the watch. And this is a super historic watch for many reasons, because of the three-dimensional moon phase indicator, because of the triple parachute, and because of the balance wheel and terminal curve, which we'll talk about later. But the first watch to bring the triple parachute to the front of the watch was the DBS, which was in 2005, and we have this watch right here. So then, qu'est-ce que l'idée ici? Pourquoi vous avez mis le triple parachute sur le, en fait, le cadran, mais le, le face de la montre? Bon, en fait, euh, l'idée de la DBS, c'était de, de, de montrer en fait, euh, le mouvement de la montre. Donc, euh, c'est de faire un calibre qui permet en fait, à, à, voir, euh, à voir le mécanisme. Euh, et, et, et donc, en fait, euh, l'idée, c'était de, de tout retourner, de tout, de tout inverser oui. et de proposer euh, des montres euh, où, en fait, on faisait un petit peu... Euh, on, 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 en fait, on partageait, nous les horlogers, on voit toujours les mécanismes hein, et pas forcément le, le porteur. Et donc, on partageait un peu euh, notre vue mécanique euh, auprès du client. Et, et je trouvais beaucoup plus intéressant vraiment de montrer le mouvement en entier sous forme d'une montre euh, que, par exemple, euh, ouvrir des parties de mécanisme. Oui. Et puis, euh, c'était un peu différent, c'était une autre façon de montrer euh, la mécanique, c'était de changer, d'évoluer un peu dans la tradition horlogère. Oui, tout à fait. So, you know, uh, what's amazing about this watch was Denny was thinking, as a watchmaker, he would love to take his watchmaking language and show it to the client by putting it on the front of the watch. So, in uh, 2005, you have the DBS, which is exactly this. You have the combination of the three-dimensional moon phase indicator, but this beautiful movement that's now facing the front of the watch, which allows you to see this triple parachute. So, you know, Pierre Jacques, I, you think you were still a journalist in 2005, am I correct? Yes. What did you think when you saw the DBS for the first time? Uh, it was uh, really, yes, uh, as Denis uh, said, um, it's the first time that really uh, the mechanic uh, came, uh, came up uh, from the watch. And uh, what I saw, uh, you have, uh, um, you know, really two, two personality because we, we have one very classical, uh, you know, personality of the watch because the, the case cannot be uh, such crazy, but also in classical uh, way, it's like really uh, old uh, clock, you know, t table clock can look a little bit like. Yes. It was a watch very also ergonomic because the, the fact that you have the, uh, the crown at 12 o'clock uh, and this uh, kind of flexible looks uh, really uh, make that the, the watch uh, band very well the, your wrist. And um, uh, that to, to show all the, the mechanic, what really the, 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 the caliber have inside this triple parachute, this 3D moon face on the, on the face was really something, uh, yes, uh, stunning and uh, incredible and really original. So. And I love the fact that everything comes from somewhere else in the history of Debethune. And you were talking about this flexible bow here mm. uh, and that actually being kind of an inspiration yeah. for the flexible lugs that you have here. So I'm going to put my DB28 here next to this original DBS 2005, 2010. And you can see in five years the transformation of the language, but you can see how there's such a similarity too. And you can see how the triple parachute has evolved from here to here as well in terms of its visual language, yeah. in terms of the bridge. It's what I like to, to say about the Bethune. Yes. Every the Bethune is like, uh, you know, the, 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 the proto of the next one, oh, the next cool. chapter. Uh, like if you look the, uh, the drawing of the, you know, uh, um, evolution of uh, Homo sapiens, you know. Yes. From, you, you see, <laughs> this is uh, the, the parallel you can make with the collection of the Bethune. Yes. You see why the Bethune, you know, we never follow any trend. Yes. We follow inspiration of the knee. Yes. Uh, also, sometimes uh, inspiration from some uh, a great collector who who can also uh, with a discussion uh, they have with Denis, you know, also to help to for, to for. But we never compromise uh, who we are and where we we from, and you can see and feel the uh, evolution of the product through the in 20 years. Yes. Uh, and uh, it's still very consistent. So I, I love the way that, uh, that, that Pierre put that. So what you'll see on this tray is essentially, you know, when you see that evolution of like from ape to Cro-Magnon to, you know, uh, to, to man walking upright, um, you can see this kind of similar, very clear evolution here as well. So you have the first in-house movement here. You have a DB15 with a triple parachute. You have a DBS with a triple parachute on the front. You've got a DB28 with a triple parachute here. And just to be cool to you guys as well, we've um, taken a watch apart and you've got just a plane movement so you can see really in depth to the triple parachute. It's cool de voir l'évolution de, de votre langage euh, de l'horlogerie ici, oui. 
Oui, oui, oui. Et, et, et comme, le disait, comme le disait Pierre, en fait, c'est qu'à chaque, à chaque fois euh, que l'on travaille sur quelque chose, euh, moi, je, je suis toujours inquiet, toujours, je, je pense que je n'ai jamais fait assez bien. Ah et oui, donc, je me dis, mais comment, comment euh, là et, et en fait, celle d'après, en fait, ouais. arrive automatiquement dans la tête. On dit, ah ouais, mais on pourrait encore faire ça, ça, ça. Euh, C'est sûr que la DBS, par exemple, il y avait une recherche du, du confort au poignet mais qui n'était pas abouti, euh, c'était mieux sur la DB28 et, et, et ainsi de suite, comme ça toujours au niveau technique euh, sur le, le trip par chute mais aussi sur les autres choses, c'est à chaque fois euh, une petite pierre qu'on rajoute euh, pour toujours un petit peu euh, améliorer Incroyable. Euh, et, et qui fait qu'effectivement il y a une logique, il y a une continuité oui. euh, dans, dans le travail. Amazing. Uh, Danny, who's an incredibly humble man, incidentally, you guys should know that he's like one of the most humble and sort of understated guys in this business, which is sometimes not full of the most understated people. However, he was saying that um, for him, he's never satisfied. And for every time he achieves something, he's always trying to see how he can improve that. And that's what you see here on this tray, the constant evolution of his watchmaking language. And it's just something beautiful. And I love the fact that when you look at a Debethune and you see the triple parachute, that came from a desire to functionally innovate, right? It wasn't just to, hey, let me create something cool. It was, let me create a really sophisticated um, anti-shock system for a wristwatch. And that's what you have here. So guys, what we were discussing is how Denny's watchmaking language went from the back of the watch to the front of the watch. And so there was two watches that were super important for that. One was the DBS, which is this watch right here. And as you can see, this is uh, 2005, and you see the gravitation of all these signature things, the balance wheel, the movement, uh, the balance bridge, the three-dimensional moon phase indicator, all coming together, together in a consolidated uh, design language for Debethune. But another watch that was super important in the evolution of Debethune, which has a huge uh, influence on the DB28, is the Dream Watch. Denis, vous pouvez expliquer comment le, le Dream Watch c'est très important au niveau de l'évolution de la langage technique et aussi esthétique et aussi ergonomique pour Debethune et l'influence de ces montres sur ces montres ici. Oui, alors la, 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 la Dream Watch, euh, les Dream Watch pour Debethune, c'est des montres pour... Euh, pour nous, qui sont des montres d'essai, en fait. C'est-à-dire des montres d'une certaine incertitude. Est-ce que l'on va vers quelque chose qui est juste et, et, et comment on peut aller un peu plus loin Donc, effectivement, sur cette montre, euh, on a mis les, les cornes flexibles pour essayer encore d'améliorer le, oui. le, le confort. Et on a commencé à travailler euh, sur les ponts, la finition des ponts, euh, les balanciers, enfin les différentes, euh, les différentes évolutions en fait. Et en fait, cette montre-là commence à avoir euh, une évolution importante en direction de la DB28, même si au, au premier coup d'œil, ça ne se voit pas forcément. Euh, C'est quelque chose d'assez important. Là aussi, la recherche aussi euh, de qu'un utilisateur on puisse euh, échanger avec sa montre. Euh, elle avait aussi un système, les premiers systèmes de, de réglage pour pouvoir légèrement ajuster la montre en ah fonction oui. du porté. Ah, C'était déjà euh, voilà, une, une toute première réflexion en fait. Euh, pour, en fait, moi j'ai toujours voulu euh, que, que nos montres soient ouvertes vers les porteurs et vers les clients oui. euh, plutôt que de leur dire maintenant elle est comme ça et c'est tout donc qu'ils puissent interagir avec incroyable so guys uh, what Denny was talking about is that this watch is incredibly important in terms of the evolution of the Debethune and in particular towards the creation of the DB28 which is the tourbillon version of the watch that I'm wearing on my wrist here and you can see that the movement has been turned to the front here as well but from a perspective of the case you have these flexible lugs for the first time which really improves the Ergonomics. It's funny because, uh, you know, for him, he was saying that these watches are montre uh, d'essayage uh, watches, almost like prototypes, I suppose, like functional yeah, concept, watch, concept yeah. watches. Uh, and it's for the clients also to learn to interact with them and give their feedback as well. But it's absolutely stunning. So maybe now would be a nice time for us to start talking about the tourbillon. Est-ce qu'on peut discuter un peu de tourbillon? Le tourbillon, en fait, le but de faire un tourbillon, c'est venu euh, relativement tardif euh, dans, dans la conception des mouvements, euh, parce que moi, je ne voulais pas euh, faire un tourbillon qui était la réduction euh, d'un tourbillon du monde de poche. Okay. Parce qu'en en fait, techniquement, ça ne peut pas fonctionner. Euh, c est, c est, c est pas, ça ne peut, peut pas être une homothésie. Euh, il faut recalculer l'ensemble euh, du mouvement, l'ensemble des forces, l'ensemble des puissances euh, pour être sûr d'avoir un tourbillon qui est adapté à la montre bracelet. Oui. Parce qu'en en fait, on bouge beaucoup. Oui. Le bras euh, a beaucoup de petits chocs et beaucoup de sensations. Oui. Et avec un tourbillon 
entre guillemets, qui serait de trop grande inertie ou trop lourd dans la montre, il va toujours avoir envie de s'arrêter, de donner des petits blocages en avant, en arrière, et ça va poser des problèmes. Ok, donc, so, uh, une chose qui était vraiment claire pour Denny, c'est qu'il quand il a approché le tourbillon, il ne voulait pas juste prendre un mouvement existant de pocket watch ou prendre la technologie d'un mouvement existant de pocket watch tourbillon et l'appliquer à une montre de montre. Parce qu'une montre de montre a beaucoup de différentes fonctions d'une montre de pocket watch. First, c'est sur votre montre et c'est constamment mouvant. Et si vous avez un montre de tourbillon, il sera affecté par tous les différents mouvements et les petits chocs que vous recevez au cours de la journée. Donc, qu'est-ce que la solution que vous avez trouvée pour Alors, la, alors la, la solution, euh, c'était de faire des inerties les moins grandes possibles euh, au niveau du, des pièces du tourbillon et du tourbillon. C'était donc de le faire le plus léger possible, de ne pas le faire trop grand. Alors, c'est un petit peu dérangeant parce que les gens aiment bien voir un beau grand tourbillon. Oui. Mais, et ils ont qu'à mettre des lunettes, c'est tout aussi beau. Parce que c'est encore plus magnifique parce que c'est encore plus magique, plus petit. Oui. Mais c'est très, très bien fini. Oui. Et, et, et donc, euh, c'était euh, d'avoir de, de, aussi une, une fréquence très importante. Ah oui. Pour que le balancier, en fait, ait une grande fréquence et que le tourbillon tourne vite. Oui. Et donc, en fait, le tourbillon tourne en 30 secondes. Oui. Et la fréquence, c'est de 36 000 alternanceurs euh, avec une légèreté maximum sur la cage oui. et une énergie maximum sur le balancier pour avoir un bon, oui, un oui. bon réglage. Et, et, et c'était toutes ces choses-là qu'il a fallu mettre ensemble pour, pour réussir à faire en fait un tourbillon qui était vraiment efficace au poignet de euh, bracelet, euh, vraiment quand on le porte, vraiment, pas seulement sur le banc de mesure des horlogers. Yes. Yes. Uh, and so as we heard earlier, Pierre Jacques likes to work with his hands. So if he was to wear a tourbillon as he's moving throughout the day, whether he's doing his off his a ski or he's working in his car, he would still like to be able to wear a tourbillon. And one of the very few tourbillons you could wear is the one created by the wonderful Denis Flagelet because it is a watch that has been optimized to be worn on the wrist, right? And how did he do this? Well, everyone would love to have a big heavy tourbillon cage, but this is very poor for a wrist watch tourbillon. So he wanted to have a tourbillon that has a balance wheel with the maximum inertia, but is as light as possible. And that's why he used a combination of silicon and white gold for the um, exterior because you want it to have maximum inertia meaning the position of the weight is as far to the perimeter as possible while having the least mass then on top of that he wanted to have a tourbillon cage that was incredibly light so actually he basically re reconstructed the entire design for a tourbillon cage to make it as minimalistic as possible he made it purely from titanium and silicon and it weighs 0.18 grams which as I said before makes it one of the fastest and to create the greatest autonomy from micro shocks and from gravity or from anything or from movement even uh, you have Have this tourbillon revolving very quickly so you have it revolving in 30 seconds which means two complete revolutions every minute and then on top of that you want the balance wheel to have as much autonomy as well for micro shocks by having a high frequency and that's why he decided to do it at five hertz pure jack am i right this is a great tourbillon for you to be able to wear every day in any kind of situation it's a great tourbillon and what i want to add is that you can really see um, that everything that denis developed yes is not uh, it's just Um, development will really have a watch making sense. It really brings something to the performance. It's not only an aesthetic, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, trip. It's really uh, if when you start to develop and to work on a complication or, or on a triple parachute or on tourbillon, it's just because you want to make it work better to to bring something to the watch making in general. Yeah. So it's a uh, yeah. L'esthétique, l'esthétique de ce tourbillon est en fait, l'esthétique de ce tourbillon est en fait une conséquence mathématique. Ah oui Mais oui, parce qu'en fait, euh, d'abord, tout calculer mathématiquement, oui. en fonction de comment euh, les accélérations, les inerties, comment un bras va bouger, comment, euh, comment on va porter cette montre au quotidien. Donc, avoir des calculs mathématiques qui disent on ne peut pas dépasser cette limite-là, wow. si on veut que ça fonctionne correctement, si on ne veut pas avoir des micro-arrêts du tourbillon, des micro-coupures, des, 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 des petits soucis de fonctionnement. Et donc, c'est complètement mathématique. Et quand tu as fini les calculs, tu n'as pas beaucoup de choix esthétiques derrière. C'est un jeu de réussir à le faire joli, mais tu as peu de choix esthétiques parce que tu es obligé d'utiliser des matières très légères comme le silicium ou comme le titane. Et, 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 et au niveau des, des dimensions, bah, ma foi, c'est tellement réduit, mais ça doit être assez solide quand même, qu'en fait, il y a assez peu de... C'est presque naturel 
de l'équation mathématique que tu as sortie. Incroyable. So what I love about that is, is, is exactly what Pierre Jacques was saying. Like nothing at Des Bethune is done just purely to look cool. Uh, it's uh, the entire aesthetic of the tourbillon is based on his mathematical calculations to optimize the performance of the tourbillon and actually in the stability and the reliability of the tourbillon. So in some ways it could look no other way except to look like this. And especially, you know, I love this also when you see a tourbillon cage rotating so quickly, it's not just because he wanted to make it look cool, but again, he wants to provide the greatest autonomy from shock. So, um, uh, it's a cool, uh, <laughs> magnifique, uh, Denis.